Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Thanks for tuning in. We have a great show for you, and this is a syndication show with a twist. So my guest is Tilden Muschietti, and now he is a syndication coach, but also a syndication attorney and a very experienced syndicator. So we're going to talk about expert legal guidance to become a syndication lion. And at the end, you're going to hear about what a syndication lion is. But this is a syndication show, but we go all through Tilden's background. And this is a legal episode too. So this can help you in a lot of ways if you're interested in syndication now or in the future. Let's go. This is episode 185 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Tilden Muschietti. Tilden is a securities attorney, syndicator himself, a syndication coach, and an authority with a best-selling book called The Complete Commercial Real Estate Guide. He has a lot of time in the business with syndications. Tilden, welcome to the show. No, oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and I was telling you in the in the pre-call, we've had a decent amount of syndication episodes, but this one comes with a twist because you are a syndication attorney as well, and you do it yourself. When you were younger, when was the first time that you remember thinking about real estate? Because then I want to see how it <laughs> plays into the legal end and, and okay, how you ended sure. up where you are. Oh, yeah, real estate a long time. So um my real hobby as a as a little kid, you know, as seven or eight year old, was I would draw floor plans of our house. And my parents had this giant graph paper, and yeah. I would go measure the house, and I would draw the floor plans so I could find places to hide and scare them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was kind of the start of it. I did it. I don't know. I probably did it a hundred times. Yeah. I got out of college, and then I was getting an MBA. And really, my whole thought process was I'm going to go into being a developer. So my idea at the time was to do modular home-based mm-hmm. assisted living facilities. So the modular home to bring the cost down yeah, was course. a pretty good idea. Still haven't done that project yet. <laughs> a little busy. Uh, yeah. But I thought, okay, well, it would certainly would help for me to become a lawyer so I could understand the property issues. I could understand, you know, how do I'm supposed to get money for this? So I went into law school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Do you remember? I mean, if you're like me, because of course I'm an attorney as well, and I remember taking property law in law school, and it was just like unlocked all the stuff. Because I grew up with a dad who was an investor, so I was always looking at properties. But I, I didn't. I thought I was just going to be a lawyer, which I ended up doing. But I remember being in property and like, wait, I, I know a lot of this stuff. Like I've been thinking yeah, about totally. a lot of this stuff, and I thought it was really cool. Did you have that going on? Because that class was just like yeah. a mind blown for me. I loved property. I think I'm, I might be the only pre- person in the in my class that uh, that enjoyed it. <laughs> so, yeah, I loved it too. <laughs> you know, I didn't I didn't like torts at all. Yeah. I, uh, I but I liked property, and I liked I liked anything dealing with property and tax or yeah. You know, those were the the things that I really found them interesting. So. Yeah, I I I always like and I think of that because I think of property like when people go to take the real estate test for an agent, I always say like agents don't use this. It's for investors, <laughs> like yeah. all the good stuff when you get your licenses for investors, just like in property, like the things were just, you know, pinging off me like, oh, wow, these things are going to be relevant to me at some point. Mm-hmm. Did you think about buying property then while you were in law school or did that all just start to, to flow as you as you finished? No, I was, and I was, out what I was do? very active on LoopNet at the time. So I was always looking even, you know, I didn't have I, all my money was going to the school at that yeah. point. But I was always looking at and like thinking, oh, what, what could you put there? Or, I like looking at land more than I look like existing buildings. At yeah. That time. Yeah, well, that goes back to your sketching the floor plans, too. Yeah. You're kind of like wanting to build something. So you were looking at LoopNet for land for commercial, because obviously LoopNet's commercial. Yeah. So you probably, a lot of people start on this aspect of residential, I'm going to house hack. You were just going right in thinking commercial. 
I was always thinking commercial. I mean, I would, you know, in college, I probably, I drew a lot of houses that would be fun to build for me, but it was yeah. all, you know, just the, the crazy, let's see if I can make a house that looks like a UFO. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah right. Uh, or, or something silly like that. Yeah, so, and now, of course, you could have just turned that into a short-term rental and crushed it. But probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. It's a little different. Well, when did you start investing and what assets, uh, when you had the money and the expertise, did you look at first before you got into you know, handling these things for other real estate investors as an attorney? So it was a while. So after law school, I ended up as a litigator rather than as an investor rather than on the, the that side. I was drawn to the the adrenaline rush of it. Yep. Same. Of litigating. <laughs> and as you know, I'm sure that adrenaline rush dies pretty quick. Uh, so yeah, I did not enjoy being a litigator at all, but I practiced for about 10 years. And most of it evolved around real estate and valuation or partnership disputes or divorce or really anything that had an underlying real estate yeah. issue was was my bread and butter. Yeah. But it was everybody was unhappy. There was a lot of fighting. Really, my only friends were the other side because your your clients hate you because you're not getting them enough. <laughs> yeah. The other side hates you because you're going after them and yeah uh, really the uh, only the other attorneys uh, uh <laughs> are the <laughs> compatriots so yeah that's interesting though because uh, the way that i think of it for civil litigation they're really real estate's always at play in all of these things yeah. so it, it really is a major asset that people are always fighting over you know especially in a divorce one totally. person wants to take it one person wants to stay there or they don't want to split it because then they can't live the life that they want so real estate really is an exactly. important asset in civil litigation yeah and i like the the speed of that kind of litigation more than you know corporate lit would have just killed me i, yeah. I couldn't do the same case for three years I <laughs> yeah i agree yeah yeah i was a prosecutor so i was just like in and out as many trials as possible oh, okay i worked at the at the san francisco da's office was really my first job and, yeah uh, that was fun but yeah it, it, it had its <laughs> limit uh, as well did, was there a, a time back then where you started thinking of large-scale syndications or when did those come into view for you because uh, when i was Growing up back then, I, I don't really remember think, knowing about syndications, really, you know, when no, I was I younger. <laughs> no, my my thing, 10 years in, I had I was doing a little bit of brokerage because to try and deal with normal people who weren't fighting. <laughs> and so I had a, a commercial partner that that was a, it showed me a deal and just said, look at it. You know, it's really great. And it was a it was a development deal in Alabama. And it was. The financials were, were terrific. It had a lot of upside and it looked pretty, pretty simple. So he said, we should syndicate this. And I, I kind of knew what he meant, but yeah. uh, I didn't really. I, but, you know, like any lawyer, it's like, sure, we can do it. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you, I, I figured I could figure it out and manage to. <laughs> so, and then we did another project and another project. And then I was like, OK, now I'm. I'm, I enjoy the setting everything up. I like doing deals. And so that's when my practice just said, okay, we're not litigating anymore. Yeah. Now I'm just doing this. Yeah. And that, that can really help people get on the path. And and as I said, we have had a lot of syndication shows, but we never had someone with your legal expertise. So can, for the for people who don't understand syndication, can you just kind of explain how the setup is and what a syndication yeah. is in general? Because I think that would help kind of set the stage for us. Yeah. I think the, the best place to start is what is a security? Yeah. And so a security is anytime there's money coming from investors and they're taking a passive role, it's very likely it's going to be a security. As long as the purpose is to make money, it's going to be a it's going to be a security. So a security either needs to be registered with the SEC or fall under an exemption. Most common exemption is Regulation D, which is what my firm works on. Right. So Regulation D lets you raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of accredited investors, and sometimes you can raise from non-accredited investors, or you can advertise. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it was it even when you first did that first one, it obviously, you know, before the internet, these things didn't exist. So when I was growing up, there was yeah. no way I would have known about syndication. Now it's like really like always kind of in our face on there, but I don't know that everyone really understands the dynamics of it. Have you seen a lot change in the syndication world with kind of like more yeah. social media presence? Definitely. Yeah. It changed. And so my first deal was in, 20 or 2000, 2013 mm -hmm. 
or so, 2012. So it was right. There was a lot of change uh, under the Jobs Act. Yeah. That was all fairly new. There was still regulation there before, but it was much more complicated. So Jobs Act made it much simpler. And then since that time, we've seen a few revisions to regulations, uh, 506, or Rule 506C, and we've seen a little bit to 506B, and they that's made it much, much simpler for for regular people. So yeah, it became suddenly something you could post on the internet, and so that's when you started seeing people advertising, you know, basically pay-per-click ads in order to drive them to their their deals. Yeah, well, I think it'd be helpful to kind of run that down because it, I think if you're you're new or you're kind of looking at stuff right now over the last year, you see a lot of kind of bad mentions on syndication when there's there's a million good syndications out there. But there are yeah. a lot of, I guess I would say, inexperienced operators who created something under the structure, as you said, because they could. Are you seeing that a lot in your practice where you're kind of weighing oh, yeah. like, you know who the solid ones are and what to <laughs> what to choose, but I don't think the regular general public does. Yeah, and I think the people who come to me generally are are already, you know, they're they're legit, right? They they want to do things right. Yeah. So right, right, or they you know go to you know uh, better call Saul or something on the side for five fifty. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if, certainly if they've seen any of my my videos or anything like that, they know, you know, I'm a I'm a straight shooter. I mean, I do, the the person I portray myself to to clients, legal clients, is the same one for investors. Yeah, because what I you know uh, my best you know, the best interest of the investor is always there because I, you know, I want everybody to, if they see that message, it's got to be consistent. Yeah, yeah, that's where I am. So yeah, I, I see what I see more often than not that's on the, the native negative side or that is people who didn't know that they needed to do it the right way who thought, Oh, okay, we can do a syndication by just asking for it. We don't need to <laughs> place a memorandum. We don't need anything. And there's some bad info on the internet too about well you just need to put everyone into an operating agreement or things like that. That's not that's not really true and can get people in big trouble. And so my general thing is yeah, most of them are really good. And I don't I probably have maybe five or ten people that have come over ten years that have been like, No, yeah. this this isn't gonna work. I'm not going near it. And they were pretty obvious at the at the very beginning. Uh, yeah, I feel like those are ones who already know they're messing up and they're trying to get some legal cover a little bit a little bit late. Whereas does. if you if you can help set the foundation, you know, like okay, we're all on the right track, we're all on the same page, we're doing it the right way, we're getting the right investors, we know we're advertising the right way. Yeah. Then you have a much more solid product, I think, when it's out there like that. Yeah, sometimes I, I mean, I've had some some clients come to me too with things that were a total mess and. And fixing it is yeah. is kind of it, it's actually kind of pleasurable. It's it's fun to do. So yeah, I mean it can it can put the wind back in the sails of the business, you know, because they could be yeah. going down a path where you can really have uh, a trouble, and then you can turn it into mm. success by just. I see that. Uh, I find that a lot with real estate accountants as well. You know, somebody comes yeah. with books that they've been not doing very well, and then somebody fixes up, and they're like, "Wait, that wasn't that hard." They need no, your assistance no. <laughs> to get the the ship back on, and and then they can move forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. In today, in today's world of syndications, where are you seeing the biggest issues where, where things are going wrong for either investors or for the operators? Well, certainly for the operators and the issuers, what affects them the most was they just didn't underwrite well. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest problem that we saw recently was in, in, in Texas and Houston with an operator who, I mean, Man, I looked over that deal because I was I I got a call from somebody. I don't represent investors, but I got a call from an investor, and yeah. they were telling me about it. And so I wanted to see what the the underlying deal was, and I looked and man, the, whoever underwrote that deal, they were they were basically telling their their investors, "Hey, we're going to buy this these these apartment buildings." I think there are seven of them in the middle of like where there's a whole slew of apartments where it's just all wall to wall apartments. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to do luxury housing in the middle of workforce <laughs> housing and a whole million other things. And there's no luxury apartment. They're going to double the rents and everything like that. And that's what their their analysis was based on. Yeah. And it just didn't work out. So they should have known better. So that 
the, just not underwriting of, hey, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Or is it even feasible to do something like this? Or what happens when interest rates rise? Or what yeah. happens? These kind of things just wasn't there. So yeah, um, that's that's really the biggest problem. Yeah, I feel like that's like almost like a utopian pro forma point of view. Like, well, oh, if all yeah. the stars aligned and everything was great, like whenever I'm doing due diligence, whether it's for a flip or a deal, I'm doing like my worst case scenario. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. what we should all do. If everything goes bad, oh, look, we're still going to make money. So if we do things right, we're going to make a lot more money. But I think, you know, in order to sell and for people to feel good about maybe they're overpaying, they're generating this like all things have to go well. And it's like built on 50 things going right that are never going to go right. Yeah, I, I forgot who said it, but it's like it's you 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 make money by the deals you did, chose not to do or, or oh, something. Yeah. Like that. And it's I'm always looking to say no. So yeah. when I'm for my own deals, I'm my my gut assumption is that I'm going to say no. Yeah, I, I'm, and I'm just looking for the reason why I'm saying no. <laughs> and so, by the time it comes in, it, it's a good deal. It's like, okay, you know, this thing is is going to work. Yeah, but yeah, I super conservative underwriting is always best. It can be improved in you know a better performance and make it more more up to date when you're talking to investors. But even then, I try to stay on the very conservative side because. You know, I'd much rather promise a, you know, a thirteen percent IRR yeah, yeah. and deliver a seventeen than to say I did a twenty and then deliver a seventeen. Yeah, I, I love that. I, you know, I think that the biggest power that we have as real estate investors is the power to walk away. And new investors have much more trouble because they're so excited to get something. Yeah. They often look at people Perfect. like you and I who are saying, like, I love saying no because it means I've made a, a good decision. And sometimes those turn out to be good deals, but I, I don't feel bad if someone else makes a good deal on it. I, I just, it was my judgment that it missed if someone else makes it great. But is it real big, smart? It's sometimes it's an ego thing and it's a power thing. But if you're doing due diligence correctly, you should be saying no to most deals because most deals aren't good or they don't most suit your buy box. Yeah. I had a business partner that was on a deal that one like came really excited with a great idea and we we're going to totally remodel the whole thing. And I mean, it was at some crazy price point. It was like 50% of what we more the, uh, than what we already paid for the building. And the, the, all the plans would have been very fun. It yeah, would have yeah. been very fun to do. We had enough cash. We probably could have done it if we had refied or something like that. But the investors would have never seen a penny. Now, yeah. We would have had a lot of fun doing it. But it, it was like, well, but why? Why would we do this? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I persuaded him enough that we didn't do it. So. Yeah. And in the syndication world, for, for people who are looking to get in as LP, there's really, uh, of course, there's a lot of different strategies, all sorts of asset classes, of course. But there's really your, your value add syndication, you're going to get paid more later, correct? And then your uh, typical mm -hmm. turnover where it's going to be raise rents, you know, upgrade the product. Those, which is what I invest in, I'm getting mm -hmm. money right away. There's really two yeah. philosophies on there there. Can you go into those a little? I mean, because I think sure. from an investor's point of view, there's so many avenues for syndication, especially in terms of the asset classes that you can get to asset classes with a, a preference of how you want it to be done. And then you don't yeah. have to do it on your own. <laughs> and your sponsors need to know too. So they need to know what, what kind of deal they have. Yeah, so. Yeah. I divide it up into whether you're looking for cash flow or you're looking for exactly. uh, appreciation and that you have two completely different sets of investors. Yeah. I have a group of investors now that that do not want any cash at all. They don't want they don't want to see a check. They you know, I have to pay them, you know, once a year to yeah. make sure that, that taxes don't become an issue, but that's it. They don't yeah. want the money. They want the big pop at the, the end. The windfall, so, yeah, yeah. But I've I've got others that they want that check every quarter, and I work really hard to make sure that it's nice and even, and that's what they expect, a regular steady check that improves slightly over time. Yeah. And they're, they're just two absolutely different people. And when you're meeting them, when you're pitching your, your deal, it, it really is, okay, which, you know, who do I have? Because if it's if it's a if it's a cash flowing deal, you're never going to sell them on appreciation. It, yeah, it yeah. just doesn't fit, and vice versa. 
Um, same thing with risk tolerance, right? I, it, selling a, a crazy idea that's a development project and that's going to do, you know, a 50% IRR in two years. <laughs> great. You know, I love the deal. You know, it, it can be fantastic, but you're never going to get that that risk averse person ever yeah, yeah. to invest in it. And you shouldn't because they wouldn't be the right fit for the They're product. They're going to be terrible. They'll yeah. be on the phone all the time to you. They'll be scared witless. Right. And then the the people who want that that sort of deal are not the cash flowing nice steady deal. They don't want it. Yeah. They want you know, home run or strikeout. I mean, but that's that's mm -hmm. part of it. If you talk to startup investors, they know. Look, I'll invest a ten startups. Two will pop. I'll make a ton of money. The yeah. other eight will completely crap out. But that that scale makes sense. But and those approaches are totally great, right? Yeah. They're totally they perfect. It's just who's the right person for for one. Yeah, you know, it, so it's uh, it's just a matching game at that point, and then um, so when you know, I I when I talk to new new syndicators, it's always you know figure out that, figure out the story, figure out all those things that are important, and then make sure make sure you're talking to the right person because yeah. you're, you're wasting your time if you're not, and you're wasting their time, and they certainly aren't going to invest with you. They will invest with you if you say, look, this this doesn't sound like it's the right deal for you because it's a cash flowing deal and yeah. you're looking for appreciation. Then when you show them the next deal, they're gonna they're gonna automatically know oh, this guy didn't try and just get my money. Exactly. They also thought about what I want. Yeah. They they will invest with you. That's really important because I think I guess, you know, overview, if you don't know a lot about syndicators, you think of them as big conglomerates when they're not. But I think newer syndicators don't if they're trying to get money, they're thinking like, hey, well, anyone who's a credit investor, let's just take them. But your point yeah. is really valid. You you should be even in syndications developing an avatar of what type of client is right for this, because those are the ones that aren't going to be asking you questions. I mean, they're a limited partner for a reason. They're supposed to be silent. Take the prospectus, ask a nice question once in a while, but generally follow along and understand what's going on, right? If you want exactly. someone involved, then they should be, you know, a GP <laughs> because you're not, you know, the reason why I started investing in syndications after I was 50 is because I finally became comfortable with being an LP and found the people that I could trust. And now I love it, mm -hmm. but I could see younger me being that like, hey, I was supposed to get, you know, 620. Why did I get 604? <laughs> I don't want right, those. Right. They don't want me in that deal, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I call it I call it the founder investment theory that that every sponsor needs to go through. And it starts with certainly understanding who your investor is and understanding the asset type and things like that. And but really at the end of the day, being able to understand the story of this investment, right? So they have yeah. a whole bunch of choices some generic building in the middle of uh, you know some generic city is not very compelling but there might be something about it that is and figuring out what that is allows you to talk to those investors who are right for the deal yeah that suddenly oh it's this is you know this is you know like being able to explain like if it's a workforce housing deal like that other deal being able to say well why why workforce housing? Luxury ho luxury apartments sounds much more yeah. much more glamorous. But you no, know, workforce housing has a lot of good things to say. Yeah, about. that goes to the story, though. Like you said, and I think exactly. that the pitch deck is really important because I, I personally, a good pitch deck, I really don't. I, I, I generate maybe one or two questions, but I always rescan the pitch deck to make sure it's not answered. When the questions that come up are then answered, then I'm way more my trust level goes up even more because I'm like, well. They're, they're, they're way ahead of me, you know, and if they're ahead of me, that's yeah, a good exactly. sign. The hard thing is that pitch decks can look really sweet now and just be full of like, untruth. So you have to get savvy enough to understand which is which. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, just when I see them, it's the more words, the less likely yeah. I, I, I believe it. Uh, good that's numbers. My personal yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people, sponsors out there that with a lot of words on their pitch decks that are great. But for me, it's like, boy, if I can't understand it real quick. Yeah. I, yeah. So probably think, not I want to I want to <laughs> know what the play is, because I think for someone who's coming in to invest for the first time, it needs to be very clear, like we were saying. Like, which is the play on this? If you're doing a hotel conversion, you're going to wait for a while because there's no tenants in there. We're not making any money. If there's a strict, yeah. you know, we're going to up the rents and we're going to stay at 80% occupancy, we're going to be getting income. We're going to raise the value and then probably sell. So I think that's important. But isn't the true value of investing in syndications is most of them are going to sell out at a much higher value after doing sure. either doing value add 
hard hard value add in terms of like renovating the entire buildings or doing mm-hmm. like soft value add raising rents making it look prettier adding amenities yep. and then you get a windfall somebody else is going to buy a completely new finished product right mm-hmm. yeah you're basically making something turnkeying it for them i mean that that's generally the play there are some good cash flowing deals where it's they're just never going to sell really yeah um but that's Those important to know up front calm. too because isn't yeah. one of the uh, sorry to interrupt you but isn't one of the biggest problems for LPs who don't know is that they want their money back before it's time yeah. to get your money back and that's that's where you need to know where where you're you know where the expectation is exactly i've never had a deal of my own that hasn't had somebody have a life event or right, something right. where they needed the cash uh, fortunately i've never had a deal of my own where we haven't had a solution for them, right? Yeah. So, because it happens every single time, it's you can you know, sponsors need to think about it because it's gonna happen. Yeah, and it's certainly good to be able to help help your investors if you can. But yeah, if you're if you're on some law, if it's a development timeline, geez, that development, you know, it 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 takes a, it takes years, and yeah. It, yeah, there's no cash, there's no money coming in, so. Yeah. You know, what's, make sure your play is okay. Yeah, and that goes to what we said before. It's risk tolerance and expectation and knowing I want to dunk some money. I don't want anything back. I specifically want the bigger windfall later and just to let it ride. Hey, it's Jonathan. I hope you're enjoying this episode with Tilden Muschetti. For me, it's always great to have another attorney on to talk a little bit of law and how it relates. And I want you to pay attention to these things because it can really help you when you're choosing an attorney in any type of real estate transaction, large or small, things to look for and how they're going to be your advocate, what the agency means between you and them. So keep an eye on that as we go through. And I just wanted to remind you that this space in the middle of the shows is soon going to be replaced by very carefully curated partnerships. Now, those are going to be sponsorships. Some might call them ads. I don't think of them as ads. We're talking real estate and real estate adjacent companies that match what we do in terms of the mindful approach to real estate investing. So don't think we're selling out. It's just that we're over 180 episodes, and now we're about to partner with some great companies to bring them in in the middle of the episode and give you some opportunities to find what they're doing. Well, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I've learned so much about about syndications over the past couple of years. For somebody who's interested in like getting into syndications, either we can start with as a syndicator, where's the best place for them to start? Say they've done a decent amount of deals, they get up to the point because I'm trying to track how someone usually gets there. You know, maybe they've done a multifamily deal that's like 10, 20, 30 units with some friends. And now they're like, well, we want to go bigger. We need yep. other people's money. Where do they start to get the structure set up so that they're not making a mistake when they start taking other people's money outside of a smaller partnership? They start hi- by hiring an attorney mostly. Yep. So they hire me. <laughs> and uh, or, you know, if they're just dabbling and wanting to understand the market better, you know, there's there is good content out there in the world. I think mine's pretty good on YouTube. I've got uh, like 100 videos that go through kind of like everything that there is. Yeah. I've seen. So the the content for me is good. Or the content from other attorneys I've seen is good. There are there is information out there from non attorneys that's really not good yeah. and very inaccurate. And I've heard some and seen some pretty wacky things that are just not true. Uh, so uh, it's it's good to have the right kind of thing. But the best experience really is to experience it. Just yeah. uh, you know, if you've got a property, try it on. Right. If you, you know, something's under contract, you think this is the right direction. Chances are you're going to do really well, you know, and certainly if, you know, with my clients, it's I'm, I'm always happy to talk finance or whatever yeah. part of the deal they want. You know, and I'll tell you if it's a bad deal, you know, or I'll tell you if it could be OK, but I wouldn't do it. You know, yeah. just to, you know, I'll, I'll give you exactly what it is. I mean, it may cost me a, a client, but <laughs> it's not. You know, at the end of the day, I'd much rather everybody have really good deals. Yeah, that that goes back to us both being uh, available to say no. I mean, that's I think that's yeah. how you serve your clients best. Sometimes what's in clients' best interest is us protecting them from themselves. 
Because well, there's so many good deals. There are a lot of good deals out there. Yeah, they yeah. are hard to find right now. That's true, but they are there. And you know, I I see you know certainly my clients. I see them you know every day. They're like, oh wow, that's really good. And uh, you know, there's so there is a lot out there. It just may not be the right one. Yeah. You touched on something in there, though, uh, when you're talking about financing. One of the most important things that I look for when I'm going into an LP is what debt they're getting the asset at, because right now that's what's caused a lot of problems. People taking yeah. bridge loans or shorter loans that that they couldn't finish in time. Very How important is that in terms of like, I really look at operator first, and then I'm looking at the product. Is this an asset that I'm interested in in an area that I'm interested in? I don't have to live mm-hmm. there, but like I want to know it's a burgeoning area. And then I look at what debt they're taking on for the project and the length of it. Sure. And after that, if everything matches up, like I'm already 80 percent there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly that debt component is is the major risk. Right. So yeah. I have had I've seen deals where. The loan was okay, but just development. In fact, I was uh, I was counsel on on one deal that that didn't go well, and the reason it didn't go well is they had entitlements, they had the space leased, and it just the city delayed because of COVID. Yeah, the approvals it delayed by three years. Yeah, the debt could not support it. Yeah, yeah, it went belly up because you know it. It, it was it was unfortunate it, it, you know people lost money because of it but it was only preventable by not doing the deal and you did they did the best deal that they could at the time but they didn't underwrite to well what happens when in, interest rates go up uh, yeah. or if our timeline goes out yeah a couple things uh, one uh, have you found i mean at least in my limited experience you have much more than me but i found that that syndicator operators who are doing multiple syndications and have their relationships, they're always getting the best debt because they're right. reusing the companies that have already given them debt. They know that they're a great person to work with as opposed to newer who maybe they find some, they're not getting the best debt though. It's just not available. Am no. I correct on that? Yeah, it, it gets better. It definitely gets better. It's just the same thing with like, if you can get a loan, most of the time from a local bank, you'll most of the time have better terms yeah. than you than if you're using a big one. Big ones, though, if it's a complicated structure, are much better just because they can understand it better. Yeah, you know? yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I love, let me ask you about about skin in the game, because for me, again, mm-hmm. that's another question that I ask, you know, syndicators, yeah. how much skin do they have in the game? Is that important from your context, even I guess on, on both sides? You know, for me, I just want to know if things go wrong, they have cash to cover it. I don't want to get a capital cost. So I just want to know they have way more than I do into the deal. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, skin in the game is, I mean, it's it's always a topic. It's a very important topic for investors. I, as a sponsor, I, I never want to have. So I work pretty hard to not, but I know I'm going to get asked it when I'm talking to investors yeah. and, you know, you have to tell them what, what the answer is. Yeah. I do tend to bundle some of my work that I will get reimbursed into, into skin in the game yeah. as a way to get myself that, but not, not be out of pocket and right. I can use my capital for other things. Yeah. But that you, you have a, you have a barter trade for that in there because of your legal yeah. background, bringing it to the table. So I think, I think that's smart. Yeah. As an attorney, I, it's not, it's certainly, it's not even anything I would necessarily say, put in your PPM or anything right. like that. I have put it in PPMs for people uh, when they needed it to be able to talk to certain investors that they knew that they were going to be getting where there was going to be a question, but it's not, it's, and that's also kind of a common legal misconception is it's not required, right? right? So a sponsor doesn't have to put any, they're working on this deal. They're entitled to get paid something. They should get paid something and they aren't required as a matter of law to do it. Yeah. Now, I mean, investors may, may not do the deal because of it, but you know, there's no, you know, you'll never get in trouble for not doing it. Yeah, I think, I guess, per, you know, perception wise, it's definitely more important on a first first syndication. Do you want to know they have something yeah. in the game? When somebody's done six or seven, they're usually oversubscribed. So there's really no reason for yeah. them to put skin in the game. They have a waiting list of 13 who can't get in. So why why dunk their own money? 
Yeah, exactly. And and it depends on the deal. I mean, a development deal is different than a value add deal yeah, versus right. even a, investing in a business. And so, uh, you know, the the amount of like if I'm doing a business raise, I probably don't need to put any at all. Probably yeah. doesn't come up. Probably nobody cares. If I'm doing a development deal, it's much more of an issue. Than, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because so. it's a it's a longer hold. In terms of the the capital calls, which seem to have happened a lot more lately, what's the biggest reason that you're seeing within the last six months to a year for capital time. calls? Time is is always you know the adage in brokerage was always time kills deals, and yeah. the adage in syndication that's that's fair too. Uh, certainly in development deals, or that that causes the cost overrun or things like that. So is it that they're they're taking on a one year loan or something at a at a good percentage, mm-hmm. hoping for the best, and then they're halfway done with the renovation, they just can't they can't catch up. Yeah, that or even just they've budgeted that the that renovations were going to take this period of time, and right. they'd be able to bump rents or whatever following this timeline. Depending on where you are in the country, the workforce may not be there in yeah. order to do the construction. And so that's a big deal. It was we've certainly seen a lot of problems with getting materials, uh, whether that you know, so that can be a factor. So the the budgeted time rarely is correct. Certainly the the estimates that you get from the construction companies are completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not I mean, if a sponsor isn't doubling the time they're they're doing a disservice uh, because it it never takes that that amount of time. Yeah, I think people forget about things like I mean we learned during the pandemic that if their supply chain is an issue which it could be now with the longshoreman strike yeah. like you just may not be able to get the appliances uh, just got that you want. What? The oh really? Oh, got good. resolved it's, yesterday. It's October so, uh, 4th. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's, it's postponed until January 15th or something. So. Yeah, but uh, like another alert that that could have drastically affected the supply chain. Tomorrow. Yeah, for yeah. for renovators, because mm-hmm. I remember in the pandemic, just just doing like one flip or just trying to get like a package from PC Richards, and they're like, "Well, the refrigerators aren't coming for six months," and you're like, "Huh?" Oh yeah. <laughs> when we bought our house, I waited over a year to get our our oven. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So I was doing some reading up on you, and I wanted you to get uh, what this term means because I really like it, but I think it will also help people. So you'd said that you work with syndication lions. What does that mean to you? <laughs> because I like the connotation, and I look. I was looking at your, you know, at your logo, and it's yeah. definitely it, it fits, but it, it also fits the way that you want to do business. Yeah, I mean syndication lions. It's not. It's people who go out there and get the, and and get the job done, yeah. right? So. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a very action oriented process. So syndication itself, I mean, our job is to make investors money, right? That's that's what they hire us for by by investing with us, and that means you work for it and you go at it with everything. So yeah. Every, I take all of my uh, my investor money, you know, super super seriously. I would much rather lose money personally yeah, than, than lose investor money and but i'm also always going to be working to try and get a better deal for them better deal for them you know make them more money make them more money yeah the more i outperform the the more the more i get hired again so yeah yeah we we almost touched on it before the kind of under promise over perform and i think when people mm-hmm. hear that they think well why would you under promise you're like you're not saying like oh i'm giving them a terrible result it's a good result no. that i'm going to make great <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to give, I, I try to promise, you know, a, a, a reasonable market right. promise, maybe, you know, as maybe slightly on the conservative side, I'd make sure they understand it's conservative. Right. But it, that's also not a promise. Right. Uh, so, uh, but then, yeah, if you can really knock it out of the park, they're going to be telling everyone they know. Right. And that's how you end up with your oversubscribed waiting list by just mm-hmm. being rock solid in, in, in what you do. I wanted to jump over to asset classes because I know you've syndicated in a yeah. lot of different asset classes. And of course, you have clients. Yeah. It, do you have any preferred asset class that, that you even like more than the others in terms of doing it for a syndication? Because they're really different products, of course, yeah. like multifamily versus self-storage versus industrial flex. They're really different opportunities. I, I I'm very much not married to an asset class. I generally don't do a lot of multifamily because a lot of multifamily doesn't have anything special to me, right? It doesn't have a story to it. It doesn't, yeah. and so if I don't have a good story, I don't do the product. So if if 
I, I have I've had done done some deals where it's been cool. Uh, maybe we're doing some sort of special concierge thing built in or some some sort of taking advantage of HUD loans or something yeah. that that makes it special and cool. Something like that I'll I'll do all day long. But I, I tend to find less of those deals than I do of something like, oh, this this logistics deal is really cool or this uh retail deal. At at heart, I really like retail just yeah. because it's complicated and interesting to me. But I'm not. I I really, when I'm looking at a deal, it's much more about: is there a story here? Yeah. And do I want to be spending the next, you know, however long that deal is, working on it? Because if it's if it's boring, there's probably a more interesting deal for yeah. me. <laughs> well, I think that's a good tip, though, for just regular investors of literally any asset, because I see a lot of new investors saying like, hey, I live in California, I can't find anything. So I'm just going to, you know, invest yeah. in Kansas. And I'm like, well, do you want to go to Kansas? Like, you just want to have one <laughs> property in Kansas. Just like if you if you don't like self-storage, why get in a self-storage yeah, syndication? You're an LP, yeah. like, and you're going to get the money, but you're not going to be telling everyone like, oh, you're not going to believe how cool this is that that's what i the way i talk about the syndications i mean i'm like i love it this is why i love yeah. it and i think that makes it as you said for yeah. you is it something you want to tell your friends about <laughs> yeah, exactly. that, that's a good rule uh, yeah. to have like if if it's not if they if they be like eh, yeah. then maybe you should be like that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> maybe you're uh, about it and then you you're going to complain about the returns that were yeah. expected and born I mean, i've which... seen i've seen multifamily deals from clients that were like very you know very local and things like that and that were it's like yeah it's here and it, you know they they get into the, all the locality of yeah. it and their investors are all local and so it becomes this very cool thing and those are those are great deals you know yeah most of the past you know, 10 years i've been in la so not as interesting <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean that, that i do think it matters because i look at if i'm looking at just my investments uh, it's i don't want to invest in multifamily on my own i don't like being a landlord yeah. so being able to invest in larger scale multifamily in towns that i haven't lived in or moved to but I, that i'm interested in and that i know have really good geographic and demographic right, scale right. it's like you know like i'm gonna driving like, yeah. Google Google driving it through it. Yeah, right. But I get to kind of ride the train in this passive back seat and and watch it. And then, you know, when it's finished, I'm like, yeah, I had a really good investment, you know, in Chicago. I didn't expect that I was going to do that. But I don't have to I don't have to do anything other than be yeah. cautious on my way in. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, any tips for, for the investors who want to get into syndications now of things that maybe red flags that they should look out for when they're trying to figure yeah, out sure. what's what they should get I into? Think it's, make sure you understand the deal enough. I mean, I think it's, you know, you're going to be giving away a lot of money and trusting this person. So, I mean, trust your gut. Trust, you know, is the deal look good? Seems too good to be true. It is. Yeah. If it oh, that's a good one. Really weak. Then it it probably is all that too. Yeah. Have realistic expectations because you know there's not going to be a deal that's good that you'll want to do. That's you know will double your money in six months. <laughs> but you know, is real estate moves at its own pace, and it's not fast. It's it can be very good, but it's not fast. Fast. Yeah, you know, it's not in overnight success. It can be, it can, especially if it's like a development, can can be pretty quick, but it's not, um, it's not instantaneous, and it's not guaranteed. Yeah, and you can't go to the cash machine and just pull it out whenever you want, as we were saying before. And I think knowing the the actual length expectation is really, really important. Because as you said, people have life events. And of course, you know, you're trying to pull money from something. And you had a great, uh, a great point about it. Like, you do have ways to reposition it or bring somebody else in to, to make them whole. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of syndicators can't, you know, there's not anyone else there and the money was intended to stay. So that's a really important note of what yeah. you're doing when you're investing in a syndication, you can't just call and three weeks later and say, hey, can I get that hundred grand back? Absolutely. I think the most important is ask a lot of questions and then see that, see the response that you get. If, if the sponsors like open book, yeah, that's yeah. a really good sign. I agree. If they are kind of cagey, that's not so good a sign. They, they either don't know the answer to any of their, their questions or uh which is probably not good uh, depending on the question i guess yeah. or something just 
that you don't want to be a part of it is going on. Yeah, I mean, they really should be able to answer every question because even if it is kind of a, I mean, basic or, or dumb question, that should be even easier to answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll get questions where it's like, I'll have to get back to you because, you know. Right, I have to research well, this. Well, it's not off the, the top of my head. the roof contract with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, there is one. It's part of the due diligence package, but I have to look. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so if somebody wants to get in touch with you, they want to learn about syndications or start a syndication or work with you, where's the best place for people to get in touch with you? I know one is uh, muschettilaw.com, but I'm going to tell them because yep. uh, the way I'm pronouncing it the way you told me, but it's M-O-S-C-H-E-T-T-I law.com. Yep. Or I've got uh, check out my YouTube channel. There's you know a ton of videos there. I really try to educate more than I'm, I don't do salesy stuff on, yeah. on my youtube channel then set up an appointment i mean really just give us a call and we that's what we do is you know we can we can make sure that whatever kind of ideas you have we can go through it and make sure it's a good fit yeah and wh who's your client base just so people know coming in i mean who are who oh, are you boy. representing yeah 80 percent of it's real estate related so developers real estate professionals uh are even hard money lenders anything like that is, is yeah. certainly a major major part of it I also represent private equity companies and some firms or startups that are trying to raise money for their businesses, uh, really anywhere in between. Yeah, and I would encourage people to check out your YouTube as well, because I think one thing that, that you know that I know as well from, from using YouTube is it's evergreen. So people who are interested yeah. in syndications and they're not ready to have a call yet because they don't know anything, they can watch six, 10 videos over a couple of months and then start to get a base so that then when they do set up the appointment, they're going to have a much better appointment between you and them because they've taken totally. some intake in before they got there. Yeah, we even send videos beforehand, before our meeting as well, so people can see other videos. Yeah, that's important. But And they get time to see, you know, there, there are going to be people out there that don't want to work with me, and that's fine. But they they get to see who I am and see yeah. if they if I'm the kind of person they want to work with or not, and uh, yeah. they can make their own decision. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on. I look forward to staying in touch. And thanks for giving that legal slant to the syndications, because I yeah, think it's absolutely. been a big addition to my audience to get that extra view on top of a lot of the syndication shows that we've had. Cool. Yeah, this was a, a great podcast. So I'm, excited. I'm excited. All right. Appreciate it. That was Tilden Muschetti of Muschetti Law. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. Thanks for sticking around to the end so you can get a preview of the next episode. I record these every single time so you can get a beat on who's coming up next on the show and what it's about. And next episode, my guest is Trevor Ahing. Now, he's the founder of something called Buyer Beater University. What is that? We're going to be talking a ton about novations. If you've never heard of a novation, it's partly a wholesale with a twist, but it's the way that you can get things to market. So if you've never heard of Novation or you've heard people talking about Novation, this is what Trevor does. So stay tuned for the next episode and I'll see you then.